Welcome to the Televisuality Symposium in the Warehouse Auditorium at Syracuse University. I'm John Yoder, Assistant Professor here in the School of Architecture, and I'd like to welcome my colleagues from Architecture, as well as our friends from Newhouse, College of Visual and Performing Arts, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and other departments here at SU. Please don't be discouraged if you couldn't find a seat in the auditorium. We have remote viewing stations set up in the cafe downstairs and also on the fourth floor in this building. The event can also be viewed live online uh, through the website you see on the screen. Today's symposium is a truly collaborative transdisciplinary event involving many people. I'd like to start by thanking some of them here. First, I want to especially thank Dean Mark Robbins for supporting this event at every turn from its conception many months ago. Bob Thompson of the Blyer Center for the Study of Popular Television, who will moderate our morning session, also provided support and facilitated numerous screenings for our seminar students in his television archive. Mark Linder, Chair of Graduate Programs here in the School of Architecture, also provided support and encouraged the direct involvement of our grad students in this event. Assistant Dean Katrin Hansen, Communications Manager Mary Kate O'Brien, and the administrative staff have been ideal collaborators over the last several weeks. The efforts of Kelly Herr and her AV team, with the help of Andy Malloy and Chuck Savage, have managed to get this program online. Jean-Francois Bedard and Michael Carroll facilitated the installation of the Eye Candy exhibition by the Apartment Creative Agency here in the gallery, and Tim Fox at WSYR News Channel 9 provided a tour of their facility and a very profitable discussion with the producers as part of our graduate seminar. And so finally, and most importantly, I'd like to thank all 20 graduate students in the 642 Architectural Theory and Design Research Seminar for making this symposium happen. They've worked rigorously and creatively during the semester, reading the work of our presenters here, producing their own design research projects, and designing the flow of this forum for research and debate. Each one has been a pleasure to work with, and I know we can expect big things from each of them in the future. So this graduate course, um, Architectural Theory and Design Research, locates the activity of design research within a different transdisciplinary terrain each year. Last year it looked at parking. This year it focuses on television. It's essentially a research methods course with an impulse for practice, meaning that design research is conducted with a spirit of experimentation and opportunism and evaluated for its ability to creatively contribute to, to contemporary design debates and practices. So this event here today is only one example of an application or product that emerged from the course. Other student projects include the website, Wikipedia pages, symposium posters and programs, individual student presentations, group research projects, and a collective book of research here. Also, when the students couldn't locate the right coffee table for the current stage configuration, <laughs> they fabricated a table uh, using scraps they had on hand yesterday. So the table you see before you is a recent product. Okay. So leaving aside the equally difficult question as to what television scholars and producers might glean from architecture for the time being, why might architectural scholars and designers be interested in television? There hasn't historically been what we would call a healthy or productive relationship between the two fields, at least from the architectural side. It wouldn't be much of a stretch to describe the two fields as traditional adversaries. Many other disciplines also draw the highbrow, lowbrow boundary between themselves and television, but architects have been particularly hostile often regarding the introduction of TV into our territory as an unwelcome invasion. In the 1970s, for example, Kenneth Frampton lamented the loss of public places to the, quote, mass-engineered somnambulism of television. Karsten Harries rejected Marshall McLuhan's portrait of the global village and blamed the electronic disembodiment engendered by TV for a general loss of cultural intimacy. 
In the 1980s, Michael Benedict championed real buildings and cautioned against the, quote, sliding of architecture into the world of television. In the 1990s, Will McDonough blamed TV-centered consumer culture for the devastation of the natural environment. Barry Bergdahl, meanwhile, insisted that TV screens produce, quote, a passivity profoundly at odds with the best learning. So another common symptom of architecture's hostility toward television is the way we typically banish TV sets from architectural photographs. Photographers such as Julia Schulman don't even have to ask if the set isn't locked down, on, or in an architectural project, it must be removed. These are some rare images, actually, that uh, the graduate students were able to find from architectural periodicals over the last several decades. You'll notice, uh, however, that all the consoles or the screens um, in these images are attached to or designed into the buildings. So there's something about architecture claiming television as its own surface um, that somehow makes it a kind of viable collaboration. So architects have also favored film and digital media over television as viable spheres of influence on design. Film has fascinated many, as we know, from Le Corbusier and the notion of the promenade architecturale, to Bernard Schumi and his explorations of montage. Cinematic designs celebrate the mobile viewer, and this mobility is variously construed as liberating, subversive, creative, and fluid. But in this course, we became interested in what happens when we come to rest and the mobility is relocated to the screen. Although Liz Ann Couture of Asymptote Architecture clearly values her Blackberry, and it certainly contains a screen for remote viewing, it would be much more difficult to imagine, I would say, for an architect to promote the latest big screen TV. So this hostility also consists in more than merely maintaining the distinction between fine art and kitsch with Clement Greenberg or fearing being supplanted by the media with Victor Hugo, or even overcompensating with elitism due to a shared sense of commercial debasement. Architecture's traditional province has been the design of the space within which cultural life unfolds. So it's entirely understandable if TV's competing world in a box, with its, with its relocation of the human circle from the vertical to the horizontal orientation might be viewed as a threat. In fact, the overt ergonomics implied by this shift, which is, I would say, actually non-representational in some important ways, already signals what I would describe as a televisual shift. So one could make the case, I think, that a second machine age televisual architecture actually proliferated mainly below the radar of the Architectural Academy in the 1960s. So we're not talking about Kahn, we're not talking about Venturi, we're talking about something that's closer to a kind of constructed archigram, right? Realized, built projects. So now why the title televisuality? The term visuality defines itself as a counterpoint to the notion of an unmediated vision or a kind of natural eyesight. Visuality, on the other hand, emphasizes that vision itself is also culturally constructed. In this case, within, through, and around the effects of architecture and television. But because we've already discovered many different hybrid models of vision in this course in particular, that can easily lay claim to the term televisual, the term televisualities might actually be better for the title of this course and the title of this symposium. We'll learn more about numerous televisualities today, and I hope discussion can proceed speculatively and opportunistically as we explore historical, contemporary, and potential collaborations between the two fields. So, instead of refuting Frank Lloyd Wright's aphorism that television is chewing gum for the eyes, this symposium instead poses the question, how might we produce the longest lasting flavors 
the most vibrant colors, and the biggest bubbles. With that, I'd like to officially welcome our guests from across the country. We had numerous close calls with the airlines over the last couple days, but we've managed to assemble a truly stellar cast here today of world-renowned scholars and designers that work in the field or fields of architecture and media. The first session of the day is titled Spatializing Vision, and it could be said to be the more televisual uh, of the two. The second session, Visualizing Space, might be more architectural, at least conventionally architectural. Of course, the presentations in both sessions will inevitably explore moments of convergence and overlap. If you look at your programs, you'll see that we have a rather ambitious schedule. Um, we've asked participants to limit their individual presentations to no more than 20 minutes, so we have ample time for group discussions at the conclusion of each session. In the hope of facilitating the most productive transdisciplinary debate, we've asked all eight visitors to join us on stage for both roundtables. The moderators will first facilitate discussion among the presenters on stage, then they'll open the floor to questions from the audience. So please wait, raise your hand and wait for the microphone before asking your question so everyone can hear and it makes it onto the video. We'll have a coffee break after the first session and after the second session, Beatrice Colomina from the Princeton University School of Architecture will present the symposium's keynote lecture titled Johnson on TV. We're delighted she could join us and I'd like to welcome our other guests, Stefan Boblio of the Apartment Creative Agency, Anne Friedberg from USC's School of Cinematic Arts, Sylvia Levin from UCLA's Department of Architecture and Urban Design, Frank Lentz from the Current TV Network, Charles Renfro from Diller, Scofidio and Renfro Architects, Mitchell Schwarzer from California College of the Arts, and Lynn Spiegel from Northwestern University's Department of Radio, Television, Film. Our in-house moderator for the second session will be Brian Lonsway from the Syracuse School of Architecture. And the moderator for the first session, uh, someone I'd like to introduce now to make a few opening comments, is Bob Thompson uh, from our own Syracuse University Blyer Center for the Study of Popular Television at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. Bob? As I hear all these names mentioned and uh, look at them all on the chairs, I really feel like I may be way, way in over my head uh, uh, moderating, a, uh, moderating a panel like uh, uh, this. I know a little bit about television. I know less about uh, 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 architecture. Uh, but I am really interested in this idea of uh, blending, the, um, uh, blending the two together, at least in disciplinary uh, and interdisciplinary approaches. Um, However, I think I'll, uh, my opening remarks I'll leave so I earn my dinner and uh, uh, lunch. I felt I had to say something um, uh, to an anecdote. Um, when I, my very first day of college, I was just just turned 18 years old, uh, and I met a girl, and uh, I was attracted to her for a lot of the usual reasons. She was kind and gentle and good. She was way smarter than I was. Uh, she also was uh, breathtakingly beautiful. There was one other thing she had, too, that made me uh, interested, and that is that she lived in a dormitory that had a view that looked right into the second floor of the Roby House, that great masterpiece of Prairie School uh, architecture. And it was really close. It was a small street. Uh, we at the University of Chicago were not known for being athletic types. As a matter of fact, uh, I, as many of my colleagues there, uh, for exercise, we might hoist a volume of Proust out of the uh, 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 bookshelf so that we could read it on the couch, uh, kind of thing. But even us, we could have, uh, if we'd have been in some T.S. Eliot uh, epiphany, we could have opened the window of, of uh, uh, this dormitory window, uh, dared to toss a peach at Roby House, and we could have hit the joint. It was that close. Um, and I remember uh, uh, going up to, uh, and you know, at this time, I didn't know anything about it. I couldn't have told you the difference between a mansard roof and a flying buttress. I had no concept of uh, articulating uh, any of this kind of thing. But I remember when I would be up in her room and we'd be gazing into each other's eyes, occasionally I would steal a furtive glance out the window at this Roby house. And I couldn't believe how a, a 
chunk of space in the same city that I grew up uh, in, basically the same kind of space. The lot was about the size of the one I grew up in. The house was about the same square footage as the one that I grew up in. But how this particular chunk of space could be so unspeakably interesting, so unspeakably different from that that I had uh, 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 grown up in. The way it was divided and delineated and organized was just uh, so uh, stunning to me in so many, uh, 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 in so many ways. Um, and I think during those little uh, sessions, I was both falling in love with Nancy and falling in love with architecture at the same time. By the way, uh, to update you, I ended up uh, uh, studying art history at the University of Chicago, including a lot of courses in architecture. I ended up marrying uh, 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 Nancy. I still uh, 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 love her more than ever before. My opinion of Frank Lloyd Wright has changed a little bit. Uh, uh, we've kind of broken up, I, I should say. Um, that was the view outside north at 58th Street, this prairie school, intellectual, uh, uh, cerebral kind of organization of uh, both cultural and physical space. If you were to simply have crossed the uh, corridor and looked to the south, however, you would have seen a very, very different thing, and that was the Midway Plaisance. For those of you who don't know, this was the, uh, uh, where the side shows and where the center of uh, uh, the uh, 1893 Columbian Exhibition uh, was held, and of course on the end was the famous White City, one of the great pretentious classical uh, uh, sorts of things, totally temporary buildings, only one of them uh, still remains, only one of them remained a few years uh, afterwards. So I look south and I see Roby House. I look, I mean, sorry, I look north and see Roby House. I look south and I see the very place where the first Ferris wheel stood, this enormous uh, uh, Ferris wheel. I see uh, uh, the place where uh, Little Egypt first did her hoochie coochie dance that totally uh, uh, gripped the entire, uh, 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 the entire nation. A uh, little bit uh, across the way where Buffalo Bill's Wild West show happened. Uh, in the buildings of this uh, uh, 1893 fair were introduced the likes of uh, uh, the motion picture in its early uh, 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 stages. Um, in many ways, I think that World's Fair, re that exhibition, really represented the symbol of this emerging new century that was going to be all about motion and spectacle and looking at things through frames and movement and all of these other sorts of things that in many ways were the antithesis of what I could see if I simply turned my head 180 degrees uh, uh, to the other uh, uh, direction. TV, of course, didn't get introduced into, at the uh, uh, 1893 uh, World's Fair. That would have to wait almost half a century, 46 more years, for the 1939 World's Fair in Queens, where David Sarnoff made his first big uh, demonstration of uh, the medium. But I think already, in 1893, uh, so much of what would become the televisual culture, this crowning glory of all of this new technology, new ways of organizing audiences and uh, uh, the movement from popular to mass culture and all the rest of it, were really already in place. And in a strange sort of way, 30 years ago, when I was looking one direction to Roby House and another direction to the site of Little Egypt and the Ferris Wheel, I think there was a real sense that uh, uh, Already, I was beginning to see and beginning to move into the direction of being interested in the idea of what happens when these two worlds begin to collide. By the time I got to college in 1977, they, of course, had already collided. The carnage was all over the road, and we were kind of looking at that mess and figuring out what is it that we do now. I'm not sure this has anything to do with what any of these august people are about to talk about, but it's as close as I can figure out to kind of the sort of spirit of what, uh, uh, what's going on here. Um, once we hear all of the uh, uh, papers, hopefully as moderator, I will be able to adjust my uh, comments accordingly. John, I think you're now going to introduce all of our people. Thanks, Bob. The first uh, presenter today is Anne Friedberg. She is professor and chair of the Critical Studies Division in USC's School of Cinematic Arts. A historian and theorist of modern media culture, she's the author of Window Shopping, Cinema and the Postmodern, 
and co-editor of an anthology of critical and theoretical writing about film titled Close Up, 1927 to 1933, Cinema and Modernism. Her essays on new media technologies have been anthologized in Reinventing Film Studies, The New Media Book, and Rethinking Media Change, The Aesthetics of Transition. In conjunction with her new book, The Virtual Window, from Alberti to Microsoft, Anne has launched a digital translation extension titled The Virtual Window Interactive at the domain name thevirtualwindow.net. This work and the theme issue on televisual space she co-edited for the Journal of Visual Culture in 2004 have been vital texts for this seminar as they help the students to interrogate the often overused words including framing, screening, immersion, and interactivity. Anne's presentation today is titled, Televisuality and the Depths of Flatness. Anne? Thanks, John. It's going to take me a half second to set up here. But while I'm doing it, I'm going to set my uh, trusty stopwatch so that I don't exceed. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thanks to John Yoder for the invitation to this day-long dialogue, and I also have to say I'm happy to have uh, made it here, given the uh, unfriendly skies in airports yesterday. But I'm very excited to be in the same room with this uh, group of scholars, and I'm looking forward to the frisson of our discussion that will follow. This uh, is a very short paper. Uh, I'm o and I forgot to stop. Start the. There we go. The, okay. Anyway, I'm not. My time timing isn't working. Um, this is a very short paper. I'm only going to discuss one narrow aspect of televisuality a thin slice of its histories and theories. And I'll ask, as I ask us to consider the dimensionality of the screen, the role of flatness, and the depths found within. I thought I would begin by quoting myself on televisual space. And then I realized that, um, to my sort of uh, embarrassment, that the, the front of this book, which I didn't expect, uh, also begins with this same quote, uh, which John used in his seminar. And I also noted, when I just got the book right uh, a few minutes ago or hours ago, uh, that uh, some of my images are um, also uh, replicated in the book. So I apologize for that uh, redundancy. But this is from the special issue of the Journal of Visual Culture several years ago. And it's a passage which may set the grounding for the turn that I'll take today. And I'll read it very quickly since you've been reading it on the screen not just the screens of television, cathode plasma projection LCD, not just the flow and style of its programming, not just its choices of network and channel, not just broadcast cable, satellite, or internet streaming video imaging, not just live or time shifted, not just console games promises of interaction and immersion, not just the material presence of the screen, but the metaphysical largesse of a remote visuality. Televisual space is both the space of the televisual and the changes produced to the, by the televisual to space itself. <laughs> and now, as videos stream off our computers, as iPods and iPhones and the ubiquity of other devices carry the televisual into our laps and in our hands, keeping it mobile with us, I want to talk about the materiality of the televisual, about the scale and depth of the screens that bring the far off Tella so close. In this case, I'll forego the far-off galaxy of the deep past, the development of light-based projections, which began by piercing a dark room with, the aperture of with an aperture of light, and carry a very long history of producing moving images on a dark interior wall. Because it is only in the last decade or so, as the televisual screen became a bright exterior wall with the scale the size of a building or the size of a palm, and with screens everywhere and mobile and not fixed to the wall, that there's something new afoot in the materiality and the immateriality of these screens. But I need to begin with another screen, if only in contrast and juxtaposition. 
The historical specificity of the cinema screen formed a transitional surface as light became a building element in a newly immaterial architecture. The surface tension here was not only that the materials of the wall and or the reflective materials of a screen were deployed to host this light, it was also that they were to disappear as a material. But whatever this dematerializing material was, whether it was glass beaded, aluminized, pearlescent, matte white screen, or silver screen, that tightly woven fabric with silver embedded in it to produce a high reflectivity, its projective surface needed to be largely flat in order to retain the register of focus and clarity of the image. In the epigrammatics of Paul Virilio, images became a new form of light. And yet the core mechanics of the televisual are not projective, but light emitting, and rely on another material, one that links the technologies of the televisual more directly to the technologies of the window, glass. Glass, of course, of course, I'm rethinking this, replaying this now, because it was the flatness of the wall and the screen. It's two-dimensionality that made it a surface to hold the illusion of a deeper dimensionality. And this tension between the second and third dimension, debated for centuries in theories of perspective, also recalls the architectural materiality of the window as it developed to negotiate the tension between its two-dimensional surface as transparent and the three-dimensional scene seen through its flat plane. So here I have a short polemic on glass. Glass is a material of boundary and barrier, veil and filter, threshold and opening. Glass could be both opaque and transparent. Glass is a material, but, also, but it also became a conduit for the immaterial of light that coursed through its panes. Its uses for lenses, mirrors, and windows demonstrates its wide utility for scientific, philosophical, and architectural purposes. Glass was a key material of modernity as the window changed its relation to the wall, as transparency became a debate of literal versus phenomenal, and more recently, as the plate glass window ceded its function to the flat panel display. If the optical revolutions of the 17th century were directly attributable to the, perfect, to the perfection of lens grinding and rolled and poured and polished plate glass, we should not ignore the role of glass as a material in the communications revolutions of the last century. Glass has been an underwritten component of technologies of communication and display. Developments in glass technology led to the glass envelope of the vacuum tube, a device critical to developments in electric illumination, the light bulb, radio and high fidelity sound, the audio tube, and radar television and computers, the cathode ray tube. So although I've mentioned the cinema screen and its flat surface, the televisual screen deployed light, not as projective or reflective, but as a light-emitting source, modeled on the same vacuum glass technology that gave us the light bulb. And here, my diagram of the cathode ray tube is not quite as crisp as the one uh, reprinted in uh, the book uh, here. The spatial materiality of tube technology meant that television screens had a bulbous depth and their spatial proportions required consoles to hide them or stands to place them on, uh, as John's many slides were showing us. The tube was a clunky piece of furniture, deranging domestic space. In the last decade, as television and computer manufacturers began to forsake CRT technology for flat panel plasma or LCD displays, the driving logic was to take advantage of the ease with which flat glass, not tube glass, could produce larger screen sizes. And uh, this is an image uh, here of an abandoned CRT scene in the sunny streets of California uh, near where I live um, as a piece of lawn sale refuse. But of course, the rapid obsolescence of consumer electronics is not without its ecological cost. As the prices for flat screens fall, the ecological price of the discarded CRT screen increases. E-waste, and CRT-bearing waste in particular, is becoming the fastest growing waste stream in the world. I'm going to skip some of the data on e-waste, an average of about 400 million CRT screens a year full of plastic, silicon, mercury, lead, and copper, all classified as characteristic hazardous waste under the Resource Cons Conservation and Recovery Act. Um, the, but the switch to flat screen displays has rendered the CRT as an intransigent detritus 
The imminent switch to digital TVs in the U.S. and elsewhere will add a massive number of redundant and discarded analog TVs to this global waste pile. This sea of television housings, cathode ray tubes, computers, monitors, and other imported electronic waste not saleable at the market in Lagos, Nigeria, was dumped here in a nearby swamp. The U.S. is one of the few countries where it is still legal to export e-waste, and countries like China, <coughs> India, and Nigeria are common destinations. As a secondary consequence of the digital divide, developing countries have become e-waste dump sites. Um, and I'm skipping some more uh, uh, information on e-waste recycling. In short, CRTs are difficult to dematerialize. Flat panel displays have many differences from CRT display. Brightness, contrast ratio, screen size, but the most direct is the switch to flatness from bulbous depth. And here's a kind of transitional image of a flat screen on the wall with the CRT bursting out the other side. Flat glass. Plasma display technology is shown here, and, and, and you'll have to forgive the uh, explicitness of these diagrams, but it is really to show that the, the placement of the flat glass, uh, flat glass panels. Relies on two sheets of flat glass labeled as front and rear plate glass with a sandwiched filling of an inert mixture of noble gases, neon and xenon, with electrodes threaded through. The electrodes turn the many tiny cells between the two panels into a plasma that then excites phosphors to emit light. Like the, like the CRT, the plasma display relies on the excitement of phosphors to emit light, but unlike the deep glass tube necessary for the electron beam of the cathode ray to scan the phosphors on the tube surface, plasma phosphors are flattened between the plate glass. Liquid crystal display LCD technology also consists of two plates of polarized glass, glass substrate, with a sandwich filling. In this case, liqu liquid crystal, a material that is not solid or liquid. An electric current is sent through this filling via a grid of transparent electrodes representing the picture elements or pixels. LCD displays are also take advantage of the flat glass expanse, but are lighter weight than the equivalent screen size CRT or plasma screen and hardly exceed 3.5 inches in depth. Even Sony Corporation, whose Trinitron CRT was the first piece of technology, a TV receiver, to win an Emmy in 1973, and who became a developer of high-resolution computer displays, Sony announced in 2007 that it will no longer be marketing Trinitrons in the USA or Canada. While they continue to sell CRTs in China, India, and regions of South America, a logic I can't quite unpack given that these countries are already the dumping grounds for e-waste from US and Europe. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences also began to reward flatness. In 2001, Sony was awarded a second Emmy for its flat display Trinitron, CRT technology, a flatter screen surface, but still with deep dimensions. In 2002, Fujitsu, the leader in plasma display technology, was awarded a scientific and technical Emmy for its efforts and accomplishments since the 1960s in plasma display technology. In this fast-moving ad, which I'll show in a second, which, it, which begins with the flat transparent plane of a glass-clad skyscraper, LG Electronics, the $35 billion Korean conglomerate that sells DVD players, cell phones, and refrigerators, boasts that it makes plasma and LCDs pa flat panels from 2 inches to 102 and 2 inches and everything in between. and everything in between. LG, the world's largest maker of TV flat panels. Thrilling as, mesmerizing as, innovative as, LG. LG, life's good. The rapid zoom pulls out of one screen through to another in a mise en a beam of interior, exterior, small, large, but all flat screens that have an endless depth. The flatness of each panel disappears as the image within pulls along an axis of deep space. As the screens of computers and televisions have become flatter, more like the wall, the dimensionality of architectural space takes on an immaterial depth. Like the cinema screen, the computer and televisual screen also negotiate the tension between a planar, two-dimensional, opaque, 
between a planar two-dimensional surface as opaque and the illusion of a three-dimensional scene seen on its flat plane. Transparency becomes a metaphor for opacity of the, the opacity of the screen, as if one could see through the screen surface with an x-ray vision. The recent release of Apple's MacBook Air, the world's thinnest notebook, uh, 0.076 inches at its thickest part, demonstrates how the aesthetic of thin is marketed with an anorectic zeal. A screen cannot be too thin or too flat, not fat. The obsession with the air's flatness, thinness, is seen here to meet the mirror qualities of flat glass, as if it were Steve Jobs' somewhat outsized mirror compact. <laughs> and, okay. So Apple's thinovation, as they've been calling it, is parodied in this uh, sophomoric and rather cruel YouTube video. I'm a new soul, I can do this strange world, hoping I could learn a bit about how Where um, a not thin, not Apple laptop is anthropomorphized, sitting sitting in front of a TV screen with a tub of ice cream, watching a dimensionally challenged woman on Oprah on the flat screen of a TV. I'm not going to have to play all of this, but I'll tell you. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Very ugly. When you look in the mirror, you ask yourself, how the this happen? So you push down your own feelings, mm -hmm. your feelings, mm -hmm. and allow other people to come first. Wishing to be thinner, I'll play a little bit more of this. The laptop uses the trampoline, the treadmill, Okay, well, the punchline, of course, is uh, if the laptop is seen bulimically <laughs> dropping its disc in the toilet. Well, I've dropped this video into my talk with the full awareness of the demographic girth, i.e. the wide audience of YouTube. Now measured by Nielsen net ratings, in January 2008, nearly 79 million viewers, or a third of all online viewers in the U.S., watched more than 3 billion user-posted videos on YouTube. Not on the tube, but on the flat screen of a networked computer or an equally flat handheld device. Um, the 3.5 inch all glass screen iPhone here, which doesn't have the right time going, so I don't know how much time I've taken. Um, I can probably end here with the depth or shallowness of such flatness. YouTube's most recent, most viewed, and most discussed videos track the vices of television, sex, celebrities, and sensationalism. The you in YouTube is indicative of the pronoun shift of the user-centered do-it-yourself content supplied for free, characteristic of the web, web 2.0. From fan-generated content, the you of YouTube, to the identity branding web cubbies of MySpace and the personally programmed media feed devices of iTunes, iPods, and iPhones, these pronoun-reliant tra trademarks emphasize a new I, you, and me, pronouns that function to declare new possessive relations to TV the tube, and to computer screen space. The tube is no longer a glass-clad tube, 
but a shadow metaphor for televisuality now seen on the flat screens of networked computers, laptops, handhelds connected, and handhelds connected not to the remote, connected to the remote not through broadcast, not through cable, but through the internet and through cellular signals. And as the 2D web morphs from the flat screens of text and image to an increasingly video-focused 3D platform, YouTube changes the metaphor from the vacuum tube to tubes of connectivity. And I'm going to end here with this image, this flat image of a flat screen in the flat but deep space of the metaverse of Second Life. This computer-generated 3D web is full of flat screens, portals uh, and uh, in a further Mizana beam portals to the deep space beyond. And I don't know how much time I took, but we can have questions now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. Great, great presentation. Um, I think it's so important for architects to think about the materiality of what we kind of naively understand as virtual. I love this moment where I, I feel we've arrived and the old kind of real versus the virtual divide is not so important anymore. Um, we're going to wait for uh, questions uh, for during the roundtable discussion. We'll open it up to the audience at that time. I'd like to introduce Frank Lentz, our next speaker, who is Senior Vice President of Creative Affairs at Current Media, where he was involved with the initial design of the current TV network. It's now in its third year of existence and growing internationally. During the 1990s, he was Special Projects Director for Channel One Networks, a national news and information network for teens. He also served as Creative Executive at the Digital Entertainment Network and Creative Director for Progress City, in the 1980s, Frank was involved with commercial production, creating feature film title sequences with Saul and Elaine Bass. During his time as a student at UCLA, he lived in an apartment building designed by architect John Lautner in 1948. Frank credits this experience with launching his fascination with architecture, the fascination that continues to inform his professional work in TV. Several years ago, he purchased and began restoring a house designed by architect Richard Neutra in 1939. And thanks largely to Frank, Current TV's Los Angeles studios are now located in an exact replica of the Chemosphere, a futuristic house designed by Lautner in 1960. Frank's recognition of this already televisual character of the Chemosphere led to one tangibly productive collaboration between the two fields. Frank's presentation today is titled, Building Current TV. Thanks, John. That was a great warm-up, and you're, you're going to save a lot of my wind, because um, uh, um, what I really want to do here is not try to uh, um, present any profound or new ideas so much as to play some pretty pictures. Uh, hopefully what you judge to be. And maybe this serves as a case study and a point of departure for you guys to, um, to think about how architecture becomes television. And uh, if the dialogue, let's see. Does this, excuse me a second. Let me see if I go and play, if it'll work. I'm scaling the presentation size here for a second. Okay, looks like we're close. So, um, so John uh, 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 sort of tipped my hand, so I'm going to race through some of this stuff and sort of get to the building of current television, not so much as a metaphor, but I'm just going to show you how we built it. <laughs> the, uh, and first, before you to, to understand uh, why this is working and, and some of the challenges ahead, uh, you have to sort of, a lot of people aren't familiar with current TV, so I thought I'd take 90 seconds and let some video do the talking so you sort of get a frame of reference for this um, uh, uh, news and information network uh, that tries to make sense of the world using the audience uh, to create uh, the media themselves. Welcome to Current TV. 
It's a new network founded on a simple principle. Now it's your turn. Here you'll find action, not hypnosis. Intelligence, participation, honesty, opinion, courage, engagement. Current is a two-way information system, a TV network for the internet generation, created by the people who watch it. Our network is a playlist of short videos. We call them pods, quick hits of information, and we shuffle them like a DJ. Funny to serious, indie music to international politics, so you never know what comes next. What you can expect is something that's not like everybody else's. A third of our pods will be created by you. We call it VC Squared, viewer created content. VC Squared isn't what you've come to expect from user generated content. You know, cat videos. It's much bigger than that. It's about showing the world from your point of view, reporting on topics that matter to you, and pitching in to make the kind of TV you want to watch. Everything on current is open for participation. Pods, network promos, even commercials. We also produce pods of our own. Our vanguard journalists report on the world seldom seen, real people and fascinating stories from places no other network will take you. We built Current from the ground up to be a platform for you, the first two-way channel in a world of one-way broadcast. Are you Current? So what you sort of see there is uh, the, the sort of the fundamental idea of the network, which is short form documentary. We produce about a third of it. We acquire about a third of it and a thir about a third of it and hopefully more in the, uh, as we grow is submitted by the, uh, by the users, the viewers. Um, I tried coining a word, <laughs> the word users and <laughs> everyone in the room laughed at me so I won't try to use that. But uh, we are a media company and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, on equal footing both with our initiative with, re with the web and uh, current.com as a source that's umbilically tied to the television network that naturally for the first time uh, uh, short form content bubbles up to television uh, as part of its functionality, uh, part of its dominant functionality. So, um, and vice versa. But whereas most television networks are porting their content to the web, uh, to uh, greater and lesser uh, uh, success, uh, uh, we think of the two screen experience as, as being um, codependency that, that seems to be working quite well. So uh, there's a whole nother uh, discussion that could be, that's surrounding, uh, speaking with one of your grad students, Peter, before the, he asked a very keen question. He said, well, how do you, what's your strategy for getting uh, web content onto uh, television if you're going to be umbilically tied and you want to show the open source of this? And I said, that's a very good question. We're working on it. So um, you will see the results of that hopefully in, uh, we're launching in Italy in about five weeks. Uh, and my boss was sort of saying, you're going where to do what? <laughs> Architecture school? Okay, but get back because you got to go to Milan. So, uh, so we started with the basic idea of, of short form content and uh, my boss, uh, Al Gore, actually my boss's boss, uh, we all sat in a room and we, we agreed that Short form was definitely the way to go with the, uh, with the advent of, of, of and uh, the digestibility of web, cam uh, web content. Uh, short form would be quick bursts of information. We wouldn't uh, um, hammer our audience with protracted stories like, I don't know, I get so frustrated when I watch Stone Phillips do an investigative report and they tease and they reprise and then they give you a little kernel of information and then they come back after a commercial and they, they talk about what they talked about before the commercial and then they give you another little taste but really they've got a seven minute story and instead of taking seven minutes they'll stretch it out into an hour and it's really not an efficient use of, of broadcast time um, from an information standpoint. Um, a lot of fluff. So we said let's not do any of that. Let's, let's cut the bullshit and let's just give them the goods. So, pardon my French. So what do we do? So, you know, uh, uh, David Newman is a good friend of mine and, and, uh, and we've worked together on and off for 25 years and he serves as the president of programming at the network. And we sat in Silver Lake at a, at a, at a little uh, uh, pho noodle place. And we said, so what are we gonna do? We have this space, we rented the studio. What are we gonna do for our, uh, a set? We have to have a set, right? Because we have all the, this idea of short form pieces. Now we need a home where our hosts who can make sense of it all and sort of give it some navigational uh, component um, uh, and, and having hosts in 
television has been a good practice to, to forge a bond with your audience as well. So that's, uh, if it's for the, uh, if it's for 20 somethings, let's use 20 somethings. Let's not have snowy haired old gray geezers who are trying to tell us that they're the authority of news speaking on behalf of a news network, which you know is written by, you know, many dozens of people. And, and that kind of omniscient knowledge isn't really working for this audience. This audience has, is a multi-source audience. They get their news when they want it, uh, as they want it, and, and we want to be sort of a, uh, um, we want to sort of surf that behavior and, and be complementary to it. So I said, well, the set, okay, we've got the space. It's a limited space, but it's a decent studio. Uh, it would have the materials. I, would, I, of course, was using what I love. I, you know, I, 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 uh, as John was mentioning, uh, when I was at UCLA, I had the good fortune to sort of have a, there was a, some friends of mine that had a room for rent in a John Lautner uh, in the Sheets Apartments at UCLA, uh, very close to the campus and uh, immediately across the street from my fraternity. And that was a safe distance and, and was a safe haven for me. So it would have a lot of glass. It would have, uh, you know, would have the kind of glass that you see uh, in these wonderful Julius Schulman images of the Pierre Koenig's work, the, you know, Case Study 22, which hovers above Los Angeles. That's iconic, certainly. And what's uh, what's terribly dominant in that image also is is uh, the roof is 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 you know it, it, it's so um, it, it's so geometric and dynamic and you know you guys know all this stuff. I've been talking to a bunch of young architects. So uh, uh, my other favorites, I, I told them I'd draw upon. I'd use the a lot of the materials and the sensibilities that you find in uh, another one of my favorite architects, uh, uh, Richard Neutra, the von Sternberg House out in the Valley, which was torn down in the 70s, sadly. Um, uh, and, you know, Nehemiah's Brasilia, wow, could we do something like that in this space? No, but uh, we, could, we could maybe be aspirational in the same kinds of ways. And in Calatrava, I want to go to the Canary Islands just to see this thing. So, um, so anyway, uh, I'm taking more time to discussing the idea than, than it took to come up with the idea because uh, at that apartment building, there's the Sheets Apartments. I was in this sort of right cylindrical thing with pie-shaped rooms, and uh, and my friend who I met, who I still work with all these years later, was in the other unit, and we shared this balcony. So um, uh, from this, we looked at each other, and almost simultaneously, you know, I said, you know, you know, the Elrod House in Palm Springs has that big giant rock, and you know, and that's something that people would talk about. It invades the space. You know, it's so. Symbolic, and you know, that, that, and and then we sort of, you know, there was a beat, and we said, well, uh, what could be more iconic than John Lautner's Chemisphere? You know, a, a the house on a on a on a pole, and uh, this painting is from a friend of mine, Josh Agel. Um, uh, he um, he did a couple of these paintings, and these are just prints from them that he allowed me to reproduce. Um, but, uh, so you guys, I, I presume most of you are familiar with this. You're, some of you are studying residential architecture. This is in Southern California on the back side of the Hollywood Hills overlooking Studio City and uh, uh, overlooking, uh, looks like a big spaceship. Um, um, and we said, wow, what if we reproduce this thing as our set? Uh, one of the things that I, one of the conditions that I set forward, that I, one of the half does I like to call it, is I said, let's do something different because we have to stand out in a, in a level playing field of 500 channels. How do you pop? You know, how does your network, how do you get people to stick for a second um, and check out what you have to say? Um, and that has to do with visual style and, and so on. And, and, and let, uh, one of the things you don't see in television is a roof in a building because that's where the lighting grid goes. Um, if any of you have studied, some of you I'm sure come out of motion picture television type backgrounds. And this is a no-no. And the other thing, Anne, would, would, uh, uh, on, the, on the subject of glass, you don't use glass in TV studios because glass reflects. And it, what does it reflect? It reflects the people in the production crew <laughs> who are trying to depict the people on the set. So whether it be I Love Lucy or I any show you see with the three wall set, you won't see glass. You'll see the scenic behind it, the glass. No, but I said, no, let's put the glass in. You can't put the glass in. We need a place for the grid. Do it. We're going to build a location. So, so we built, um, we built a location based on on the original design. Uh, uh, Frank Escher and the and the John Lautner Foundation we paired up with, and uh, 
uh, um, and got their permission and and we decided to do not the early chemisphere but to do the the newly rehabilitated chemisphere which is uh, uh, owned by Benedict Taschen and he's a very very private person and uh, and and we weren't going to get anywhere we're using his house every day as a location so so uh, we built our own and we put the glass in and it was interesting to think like you know wait a minute uh, just down the hill is Hanna Barbera Studios, and 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 one can imagine uh, that uh, the chemisphere uh, informed may have formed some informed some spe people have certainly speculated that uh, what you see up on High Hill uh, it, it is it terribly resembles the Jetsons, and again John beat me to the uh, Jetsons reference, but uh, I'll show it just the same. So uh, there's the spaceship up on up on High Hill, and. Uh, and of course, in space, you wouldn't need any pedestals to hold your house up, but, but wait, so <laughs> you tell me, is that? So moving on, there's the real chemisphere um, uh, as, as it's been redone by Frank Escher and the Lautner Foundation for uh, Benedict Taschen, uh, Taschen Books. And so we said, okay, let's get, let's get busy. So I'm gonna fly through a bunch of construction, uh, just uh, slides. Um, they're not of any particular interest, but of course, uh, you probably know that sets are, are, are not built structurally uh, to withstand, you know, the same seismic and weather conditions that a uh, that that uh, that an exterior building would, um, and but uh, so we we have some of this uh, some of this construction is the glue lamb beams we cheated on we didn't we didn't actually execute glue lamb beams we cut out the profiles and and dress them to be such but it has some stru structural integrity and you can see here. Um, that we only, in the space that we had, we only had, we were able to build half of the chemisphere. So you have sort of a quadragon or something, as you can tell from this, from this image here, uh, where the uh, octagon has been cut in half. So we rendered out the uh, living room and the, uh, something else you don't see in, in, in a news network, because we're trying not to be a news network, in many ways, is a bedroom. And here's a few more images. I'll, I'll go through these quickly. You get a sense of the space. We start putting in walls, and there's there's the bed frame. So um, we thought that'd be fun, you know. Let's do let's do news from the bedroom. Why not? So. So there's uh, there's the construction, the basic layout, and here's the result. So this is uh, this is this is our set um, a, as it was uh, as it was finished, and we have this neat 180 degree uh, uh, photograph that we took just down the street on Mulholland Drive that's very close to the building uh, that we used as the scenic and by, uh, by day uh, the, the, our, our current chemosphere looks like this and, and by night uh, it transitions the same scenic is used as bipacked photography so if you light it from the back it's nighttime if you light it from the front it's daytime which is kind of neat um, so uh, and there's the back to uh, the real chemosphere so, of course, once you, once you do this, you have to figure out how to shoot in there. And since there's no lighting grid, there's no t turnkey solution for quickly doing this. So you have to actually, um, you have to uh, uh, um, do the, uh, shoot it like a location, like you would if you were on location. So I'll skip that business and go right to some, some jib, jib bomb shots of the set. We, Submitted this for a BDA award uh, two years ago, and we got one. So that was kind of neat. Don't make me. Current contributor Jaron Galinsky recently traveled to a town in Kurdistan where thousands had been slaughtered by chemical weapons during the regime of Saddam Hussein. Jaron found that after years of oppression under Saddam, they now have a new optimism. 14 suspected drug buyers were arrested on Skid it's Row. Really in phase out, one of a crackdown uh, that the LAPD hopes will make people think twice before coming to downtown LA to buy their dope. One of those arrested was actor Brad Renfro. The bus occurred in an area known as Heroin Alley and were carried out by undercover cops posing as scruffy drug dealers luring unsuspecting buyers to buy him. Tim. Andy. We're okay, go when you're watching current TV. So I went down to the port of San Ysidro, which is south of San Diego and across from Tijuana, where the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol run the U.S. ports of entry. Now they gave me a window of three short hours to film there. But in that short amount of time, you would not believe the amount of action I saw. 
Now around this time of year when it's cold outside and thoughts turn to Valentine's plans, not having a special someone to cuddle up with can be rough. Mm, yeah, okay. I just finished watching this L'Oreal Feria current hottie pod on Albert Reed and wow. Let's just say I definitely thought what most girls would think when seeing him. Right from the troops in the middle of it all. This came to us from Jose Flores and is a great example of the power of viewer contributed content. There's a floor so fan blowing those weeds revolution. just off well, camera. You're about to hear it straight from the lollipop sucking tequila shooting mouths of some women involved. But you see, this isn't studio lighting. This is, we're trying to get uh, so very clear right a naturalistic look here. are not shy. All right, now, giving our viewers a place to air their stories is a huge part of what we do at Current. You can Lots find out how you get yours on the air by going to current.tv. This VC Square pod from Marco Franzoni depicts the life of heroin users in downtown LA that they usually keep hidden. For a look at one of the more artistic sides, click on the coolest pad in LA for a profile of the man who designed the chemosphere. And you can see all the glasses reflecting down because so fortunately the, the uh, angle of the glass, the incidence of the glass is down so you see the floor and not the cameras. In store for you. And if you like this, go to channel 116 Time Warner Cable. That's us, current TV. Upload a video to our website and maybe you'll be next. From male exotic dancing okay, to the so evolution the slash creationism debate, Joe now takes on the topics of our times. You do the stories, you vote on the stories, you decide what gets on the air. So act on it. Put together a piece about something that's happening in your world, send it to us, and have it shown on current TV. Thanks, thanks buddy. Uh, There's plenty more current TV available on video on demand about life in LA. And it's made by the people in LA. Got a great story about a piece of Los Angeles? Share it. Just hit up current.tv and find out how to become a contributor. One funny little thing. Uh, the, uh, the owner of the house that helped build the house uh, and lived in it for 10 or 11 years, I believe, uh, Mr. Mallon, uh, called up one of our producers and he said, because we were doing a little documentary on the chemistry, he said, uh, when we called, he said, yeah, I saw that. How the heck did you let, how did Benedict Tashin let you in there? He doesn't let anybody in there. So if we fooled the original owner, I think we did a pretty, a reasonable job at, at, uh, at a one-to-one -one reproduction of the, of the original. So just a couple of final sort of uh, 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 thoughts. Um, the, um, the advantages, you know, it, the building has good geometry, so we really didn't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the wheel was up on a stick and we just used it. The, um, uh, uh, and, and having limited space, uh, the camera is able to go places and see little setups. Uh, that architecture has really saved us, given us many, many different looks uh, for a very uh, small footprint. Uh, so it has a unique look and feel, which is important for our network. Um, when you see this network, uh, the, the trimmings of a news set, the, 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 you know, the international style that is so, uh, so common and, and, and true and actually works for broadcast television, uh, this is really an effort to depart from that. Uh, I wanted to insert a slide of all the different tele uh, all the TV news networks, and we put them all on a grid once as just sort of like to, to uh, as, as an experiment for uh, putting pundits on television. And they were all blue. It was all white-haired guys with blue backgrounds. So I guess blue is the color of truth somehow for the news networks, and they've learned this and they've used it, and it's successful, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, it pays, you know, pays tribute to good design. I think there's something noble about that, and uh, it, it gets people talking. Uh, and it's and for and uh, the space that is for a TV studio, it's 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 very quick and nimble, and it does it 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 doesn't require a huge dwell of people and staff. We uh, it's we shoot it kind of more like an ENG uh, um, crew. And now there are you know to be honest and transparent, there are some challenges, and our network will continue to evolve. Uh, matching the the environment and the behavior is a challenge, in my view. This is just my opinion, and uh, and and. It, it, may, it may fuel some evolution of the network. Uh, you know, if our network, our, our network is founded in the idea of authenticity as being uh, supreme, uh, of supreme importance, and by building a set, are we being truthful to our audience? Um, really, the set only has function to be interesting and, and be a, a, a showcase and kind of a groovy lifestyle that's trying to be depicted, but it's, 
it really doesn't have function. And, and I, I, I would challenge that notion, I challenge it. So, uh, you know, the continuity between day and night, we pre-tape our, our, our wraps and, and, and day and night changes on the fly. And, and we'd all prefer if we had a, 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 a continuity between uh, day and night as the day goes by, at least a Pacific Standard Time. And uh, it's, it's, this isn't really any fault of the chemosphere, but we are trying to be more current, live up to our name, and it might suggest that, uh, that uh, a live model might be in our future. So, uh, and it's, it's not scalable to some of the markets that we're trying to, to grow into. We launched the, um, the UK network, the UK remix of our network in, uh, one year ago, uh, day before yesterday, we had our little one year party for the UK. And we're going to be launching in uh, Italy in just five weeks. So I'm gonna get on a plane to Milan very soon. And moving the chemosphere or rebuilding the chemosphere again and again doesn't make sense in some of these places. It, it doesn't symbolize Los Angeles. It doesn't, I mean, it symbolizes Los Angeles. It doesn't symbolize uh, Milan. It doesn't symbolize uh, uh, Trafalgar Square. Or, so so um, it's not scalable in, in these tiny markets, you know, if we're in, uh, um, current Helsinki, uh, it doesn't make much sense to, uh, to build the chemosphere. So we'd have to look at another model. Uh, and again, does, does the, is, are we being truly honest with our, with our, uh, with our audience? So there's possible thing I'm, I'm working on, which is do away with everything, do away with the set entirely. And if that was the current home, uh, perhaps the next evolution of this, and this is what we're going to try in a few weeks in Italy, is, is giving nothing but function to the host, let them drive the bus, uh, let them switch the cameras themselves if possible and take away all of the um, all of the production entirely and let them be radio DJs and uh, and get up close and personal with these uh, uh, televised radio DJs and give and, and have sort of a sexy functionalism and I thought well that's that's that seems like a pretty original thing I haven't seen that before so it's probably worth doing and until I was looking for those slides that John showed <laughs> with the uh, Fish called Selma episode of of of, uh, of the Simpsons, and then I saw this, and I was like, "Oh no, don't!" <laughs> so anyway, thanks for having me. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, very interested in the way you described extracting Stone Phillips' narrative, because that's precisely what Lautner was attempting to do, create a kind of um, operational kind of delivery apparatus, which is somehow in keeping with the ambitions of current TV. Our next speaker is Lynn Spiegel. She is the Francis E. Willard Professor of Screen Cultures at Northwestern University. A leading scholar and prolific author in the field of television studies, she's written extensively on numerous topics including post-war culture and popular media. Her books include Make Room for TV, Television and the Family Ideal in Post-War America, Welcome to the Dream House, Popular Media and Post-War Suburbs, and TV by Design, Modern Art and the Rise of Network Television, which is due out uh, imminently. She's also edited numerous anthologies, including Television After TV and Feminist TV Criticism. She's editor of the Consoling Passions book series at Duke University Press. Lynn's research critically reconsiders the catalytic roles played by television in the development of domestic and suburban space. Her critical yet opportunistic approach to issues of material culture has been an important uh, frame of reference for this seminar. Lynn's presentation today is titled Live from Television City, Media, Architecture, and CBS in the 1950s. Thank you, John, and um, thanks everybody for having me. Thanks, Bob, and thank you to the Dean. Um, it's been really interesting so far, as they say in TV, hard acts to follow. Um, and uh, my paper actually is sort of the historical rewind of what Frank just discussed, and that is the construction really of the first major TV studio. Just as 
some explanation of, of this work on Television City. It's part of my new book, which is making the argument that um, television history has sort of been written with the perspective that television remediated older forms of entertainment like vaudeville and circus and cinema. And my interest is not to say that's not true, but to say that it remediated it in the context of modern design and um, its engagement, really, with the whole field of modern design and modern art during uh, the 1950s and 60s. So this particular thing I'm going to uh, deliver today is from the chapter on Television City, which is looking at the construction of this modern television studio and is probably the most literal interpretation of our topic for the day. Okay. I'm going to start with what I hope will play. I, uh, I hate to disagree with the mayor of Los Angeles, but there's no oil under this building. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of our people at home watching the show, I would like to explain the, uh, uh, how, how big the CBS television city really is. Now, these buildings here, this magnitude, you know, in fact, we have this model made for that, you see. Now, uh, th these buildings cover an area of approximately 63,000 square feet, you see? And the air cooling system alone could make, I would say, about, well, 600 tons of ice per day, or enough uh, to keep Phil Harris and highballs for one entire evening. <laughs> <laughs> and there's enough concrete, ladies and gentlemen, in this building to build a highway a two-lane highway is eight, eight and a half miles long. Of course, we had to borrow some of the material, so in case you happen to be on the freeway tomorrow, you'll find a piece missing between Anaheim and Cucamonga. <laughs> okay. And that actually is a little snippet from the first program aired at Television City, which was called Stars in Your Eyes, and which was CBS's big promotional effort to get the network, um, get the studio into the press. So I'll be talking about the CBS television studio um, for the rest of the talk. Built between 1950 and 1953 by Los Angeles architects Charles Pereira, uh, Charles Luckman and William Pereira, the CBS facility was the first major network studio created specifically for the new medium. The architects were ideally suited to design architecture for the media. Before opening his practice, Pereira had worked for Paramount as an art director in the 1940s, while Luckman had been president of Lever Brothers, one of radio and early television's most lucrative sponsors, and while at Lever, Luckman worked on initial plans for Lever House. A hallmark of California mid-century modern design the building served a practical need throughout the television business where studio space was scarce and that which existed was way too small for the requirements of TV production. And most networks were operating out of converted uh, Broadway theaters or skating rinks or even the Pepsi bottling plant in the search for room enough to film for television without those static proscenium kinds of images. Um, Although CBS Television City had something in common with the old Hollywood movie studios, Pereira and Luckman did not primarily model it on the movie lot concept. Unlike a film studio, a TV network had to fill the airwaves with product on a daily basis. CBS estimated that Television City was capable of turning out about 28 hours of live programming a week about 22 times as much entertainment per year as the largest of the Hollywood movie lots. In this respect, it's not surprising that the architects in CBS always referred to Television City as a plant and a factory, 
rather than a studio. And observers saw it in a, in a similar light. In fact, they worked with factory people in Detroit to kind of test market it, it for efficiency of space. Describing the design, excuse me, the design objectives, Para and Luckman said, quote, our aim was to develop a facility in which the creative elements in television were provided with the best entertainment, with the best environment for projecting their talent, and at the same time design a plant in which entertainment could be mass produced with enough economy and efficiency so as to meet the requirements of the management group um, in reducing operating costs, end quote. Above all, then, Television City expressed the vision of a new form of mid-century modernism that embraced the demands of the post-war consumer economy and its increasing need to make people attend to screens, and not just any screens, but screens sponsored by big industry. My interest today is in with the ways in which Television City operated both as a publicity medium for CBS and as an audiovisual apparatus capable of producing a specific mode of spectatorship. So first, CBS as an advertising vehicle. Just as Terry Smith argues of Ford's factory, Television City served more than a practical need. Its modern design helped to promote CBS as a modern progressive corporation. CBS chairman William Paley, who sat on the board of MoMA, and President Frank Staten, who was an avid art collector um, and, uh, of modern art in particular, built, built their television empire not only through programming, but also through concerted efforts with publicity art and modern graphic design. And here is a picture of William Golden, who of course invented the CBSI. And here's some art from CBS, and Golden hired artists like Ben Sean um, to, and you can see a lot of the artwork for CBS looked very modern illustration, abstract, and it was aimed both at consumers of newspapers, regular folks, and at high-end Madison Avenue advertisers who were, they were trying to get to invest in the network and had these kinds of tastes. And my favorite find during this book was the Letter of Love by Andy Warhol, which was the title art for uh, CBS Studio One episode, and the other one by Andy Warhol, Nation's Nightmare, which has been reproduced before. But you can see they were hiring really top-notch illustrators, artists, to promote the network so that people who watch TV were actually seeing this stuff in newspapers and in title cards. They weren't just watching circus and vaudeville. And that's my interest in this hybridity between modernism and older entertainment forms. Okay, um, so Television City was an extension of CBS's vision for modern design. As a form of corporate modernism, Television City served to publicize CBS as the most progressive and technologically advanced among all competitors. And Ezra Stuller, who did so many of the um, famous photographs for modern buildings, uh, was CBS's photographer and here's just a couple of introductory shots, um, who shot CBS in ways that were obviously aimed to um, uh, a steep taste. Okay, now um, CBS also in its advertising efforts constructed this, what was at the time promoted as the hugest model, architectural model ever. It was interactive. That's the one that Benny is showing off on the television program. I'll get back to the cars later on in the talk. Um, and what's my thing doing? And it was also promoted at department stores. And in particular, it was aimed at female shoppers. You can, well, you can't see that too well, but it's a woman interacting with the model, turning the lights on and off, et cetera. That's in Macy's where it premiered in the summer of 52. And that's at Bullock's where it landed in LA in the summer of, uh, in September of 52. And then, of course, they did this big gala that I just showed you an episode, uh, the episode of. And they also did 
pro one-off programs like Edward R. Murrow going inside Television City and showing it to viewers. And I, I just show you this because, again, it's represented through modern illustration techniques. It's extremely progressive and modern. Okay, but it's not just that Television City was publicized, rather the building itself was designed according to the logic of the media. If, as Beatrice Palomina argues, what makes modern architecture is not so much new technologies or building materials, but rather their status as media, Television City is a clear case in point. Television City expressed its status as media architecture through its formal appearance, especially its demountable curtain wall, its expansive glass, uh, again, Anne tells us about glass, and TV City was promoted through this idea of its extensive glass, and it apparently used more glass than any other building of its time, and CBS kept bragging about that. Um, associated with iconic mid-century skyscrapers, such as the Seagram Building and Lever House, the curtain wall made, made the building, as James Steele suggests, quote, an appropriate symbol of Los Angeles' leadership in the media industry, end quote. Moreover, as a design element, the curtain wall invoked the television screen itself. In his analysis of the Seagram Building, as well as a multitude of mass-produced copies made in the 60s by corporate firms, Reinhold Martin likens the curtain wall to mass media and to television in particular. Like television, the curtain wall collapses near and far, inside and outside, while its reflective glass surface paradoxically, quote, makes visible and conceals, i.e. screens, at the same time, the event to which it bears silent witness, end quote. Television City takes this analog analogy one step further by making the curtain wall literally function as an advertising device. Composed of more than 12,000 uh, glass sheets, the, the service building's facade worked like a television screen to broadcast the company image. Through the huge panes of glass, one could see the vast tiled wall of CBS eyes, and that's what William Golden was standing in front of when, in that first slide, 3,600 individual eye, titles in, eye, eye tiles in all were located inside the lobby. Stoller shot numerous publicity photos of the wall, some through the glass facade as here, to showcase this see-through effect. Not only is the facade a giant glass screen, like a 1950s television program, Television City's exterior is black and white. The name Television City appears black and white on one surface and white and black on the other, and the two edifices meet at a sharp corner so that the overall effect is high contrast and sharp, sharp focus which perhaps not coincidentally were also two of the most often promoted and desirable qualities in TV reception at the time. And finally, Stoller shot daytime and nighttime photos um, of CBS City, and here you can see it looks like electricity itself, um, but I think this also uh, underscored the kind of new temporal structure of television, the day parting of, of uh, daily life through nighttime and uh, daytime views. And again, the model really showed this off, letting people interact with switching on and off the lights for um, these different temporal modes. The CBS logo and signage used on the building served in a more direct sense to advertise the corporate message. Television City was emblematic of the growing relationship between modern graphic and architectural design. And this, the building used all of William Golden's favorite typeface, and he actually oversaw all the um, type used in the CBSI logo on the building. And it mimicked all the corporate stationery, all of its publicity, and it was what print ma magazine called CBS's ensemble plan so that every image contributed to the image of CBS and no one would forget that image. And it worked very well because CBS quickly rose as the number one network for years. 
Um, okay, now my second point and, um, that I want to talk about, or at least throw out for discussion today, is uh, CBS as a piece of, Television City as a piece of media architecture that also created a particular, was a, a, an apparatus that also can uh, ask the audience to participate in a particular form of spectatorship, which would be televisual um, versus cinematic. Now, so as a medium through which to convey CBS's progressive future, the edifice appealed to business clients and tourist trade. But to the vast national TV audience, Television City was not actually a physical building at all. Instead, it was a virtual environment, and one which ideally would produce the most visually advanced spectacles on TV. Indeed, Television City was more than a well-designed factory um, established to produce efficient workers. Rather, it was an audiovisual apparatus designed to produce loyal viewers and potential consumers to sponsors. More specifically, Television City was a device for the production of a new kind of spectatorship based on ideals of appeals to telepresence, that is, the spectorial sensation of being there on the scene, participating in the spectacle on screen in a virtual here and now, which television scholars often call liveness, this idea that you are there and that the image is actually live with you. Um, and just to see what, how that was promoted in the 50s, here are some magazine ads for television which are promising viewers that, you know, Betty Hutton will be in your lap, or you can feed your little doggy through the TV screen. So this fantasy of actually being there and interacting and participating with the event is the you know, major aesthetic fantasy of television during this period, and the one that the architects tried to establish through the studio space. So given this emphasis on liveness, the architects paid considerable attention to the spatial arrangements of the studio audience and it should be noted that many of the programs originated live from Television City. Uh, two of the studios accommodated audiences, with the audience placed between the center um, camera range and the stage floor, and the audience section beginning at the lower level, a uh, lower level than the stage and raising, rising halfway back. So you can see what that looked like. The arrangement allowed for a maximum number of seats without disturbing the production on stage. And it also permitted the much desired use of mobile cameras. And again, as I said, um, producers were really trying to get away from these static proscenium images caused by these small studio spaces. So what's happening here is both an attempt to create an aesthetic of liveness and one of mobility, that the image will actually keep the eye moving and be moving. And this seating arrangement was designed to optimize that. As were uh, the hallways, which were designed to optimize uh, mobility and speed of bringing scenery flats into and out of the space. So the architects then pay um, particular attention as well to um, the questions of temporality and the demands of time on television to create this feeling of liveness and mobility. And this is, again, a different kind of time than architectural time for a factory. While Fordism relied on regimented time clocks for workers, mass media corporations had different needs. Rather than the rigid time clock, Networks had to insinuate themselves into the more flexible and flowing patterns of people's work and leisure time. In this regard, Television City addressed televisual rather than architectural time. Accordingly, the architects designed it to suit the nearly round-the-clock schedules. And you can see from the hallway, this is one way of solving the problem by creating vast spaces for mobility for set changes. And uh, the architects talk constantly about an emphasis on what they call split-second timing in Television City. And they say this emphasis has not been a major consideration in architectural planning for any other medium, but becomes mandatory in television, 
where the volume of production surpasses anything achieved and where production costs can become uneconomic unless the most op optimal conditions for efficient operations are provided. Architectural Forum concurred saying, quote, speed and directness are the key words in the design. Nothing bulky is in the way of swift movement necessary to get a show on the road. For its part, CBS promoted Television City by claiming that it accommodated, quote, the dri driving demand for speed. The new temporalities of TV time were similarly rehearsed in Television City's entertainment product, which honed a studio style based on the twin aesthetic ideals of liveness through the seating arrangement and mobility on the other. And you can see again through the stage space that it's for its time, a large space, stage space, which accommodates three folds, the scenery flats, but also accommodates mobile cameras and little vans moving around. And in addition to the huge stage space and uh, the hallways, the technology itself, things like the Eisner uh, lighting board, which had automatic timing, allowed for rapid cues. So everything appeared fast. And I'll just say, I'm sure you've thought of this already, that this has to do with the speed effect of the media. Today, we want faster and faster iPods. In these times, it was faster and faster television. And the architecture allowed for this sense of speed. OK. In this sense, the building was the material manifestation of what Paul Virilio calls telecommunications collapse of time and space into speed. According to Virilio, telecommunications instantaneous and simultaneous delivery of messages erases the distance between places, and our sense of time becomes less bound up with the time it takes to travel through physical space. Although Virilio speaks mostly of the virtual places of satellites, telerobotics, and digital media, again, the case of Television City suggests that the speed-up effect is already in place at the dawn of television. Now, the aesthetics of speed and mobility, and this is my last point, were also communicated through landscape design and the Los Angeles setting itself. Set back on the intersection of two vast boulevards in the Fairfax district, Television City was meant to be witnessed and accessed not by pedestrians, but by drivers. A vast parking lot wraps around the building creating a kind of car moat that separates the studio from the street. In its list of Television City's amazing vital statistics, Variety reported that the parking lot and roadways were made of 26,000 yards of asphalt, enough to build a 24-foot highway, and noted that the lot had room for 710 cars. And with this in mind, you can see the Benny clip as part of this aestheticization of the parking lot around the studio. Uh, but it also has to do, I think, um, with the fact that CBS TV City is a kind of arbiter of Los Angeles' post-war status as an autotopia, where the commuter and his heart car connotes a landscape of progress, mobility, and quotidian privacy, so that parking lots or residential carports come to have an aesthetic value of their own. And this is really clear in the fact that there were endless photos taken of the, fo of the parking lots. And, uh, so parked on their sofas in their private homes, yet offered the chance to travel live to TV land, the home audience was in a funda fundamental way also part of this new autotopic landscape. As Margaret Morse argued, uh, this parallel construction of television, freeways, and shopping malls in post-war America created a new architecture of experience where traditionally public activities had been reproduced, were being reproduced as models of publicness that offered new forms of simulated social life. Television City is a monument to this construction of a new form of simulated social life through the construction of television as an apparatus for liveness, speed, and mobility. More specifically, however, Television City was also an arbiter of a new national imaginary in which Los Angeles, the car, and speed increasingly became the quintessential alternative modernities 
to the dense urban modernity of the first half of the 20th century with its skyscrapers, scrapers, pedestrians, trains, and of course, the cinema. And you can see, if you think back to the Benny clip, that part of the studio style of Television City was not just liveness or mobility, but the construction of the home audience as, a, as an Angelino rather than a New Yorker. So Benny talks to everybody as if they're going to be on the freeway in the morning. And you think about a lot of the programs that later came out of LA, or TV City in particular, like uh, Laugh-In or the Sonny and Cher show, those taped variety shows, if you can ever remember them, they always had these insider references to Los Angeles. So part of the appeal is the construction of a national imaginary, I think, in which the viewer actually thinks of Los, him or herself as an Angelino rather than part of this old modernism in New York where TV began. Okay, so uh, more generally, uh, Television City demonstrates how the virtual environment of media and the physical environment of buildings mutually reproduced each other um, as as both aesthetic and cultural forms. Television City represented CBS's best effort to make, remake the city in the image of television. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, another excellent talk. I'm again struck by kind of implied transition from a narrative to an icon or a shift to a kind of performative uh, uh, or imageable um, edifice. Our next speaker is Stéphane Boublil, who studied philosophy and theology in Paris and photography and filmmaking at Parsons School of Design and New York University, respectively. He's co-founder and chief creative architect of the New York City-based Apartment Creative Agency, a multidisciplinary firm that merges design, media, and marketing into hybrid architectural environments. The apartment's philosophy was crafted from careful considerations of daily occupations and celebrates storytelling and life experience as catalysts for projecting unexpected design possibilities. In Stefan's words, the apartment is a place where ideas are born from good jokes and evolve into projects that matter. So this approach in which design drives ideology, at least as much as ideology drives design, parallels in some ways the projective ambitions of this particular seminar. Stefan's presentation today is titled, What You Talking About, Willis? <laughs> Is this thing on? Great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank John for inviting me. I feel great being here. Um, I also want to thank all the SU students who are literally enjoying the eye candy exhibition at, uh, outside, <laughs> which is really fantastic. Thanks to all of you who are getting fat on our exhibition. And so today's exhibition, as you've seen, is called What You're, Go uh, <laughs> what You're Talking About With Us. And that's a bit misleading, because you may think that I'm going to talk about different strokes today. Uh, and I would never dare do something so silly in an architecture school. Uh, no. What I'm about to talk about is my own dismay, really. Um, that happened a few months ago when John Uter came to, me, <laughs> came to me just as beautiful as that um, and talked to me about televisuality and this idea that indeed, or so he put forward, uh, television had really bypassed, or rather architecture had really bypassed television as a source of inspiration going straight to cinema. And I looked at him and in my head I said, what you talking about Willis? Uh, I, I really couldn't quite grasp the, uh, the difference of opinion that he was talking about between television and, and architecture. 
And so I started looking at this idea, this idea of, of television and architecture within it, uh, and started to look around at what was available. And indeed, I saw that the icons of architecture, which we cherish or don't today, are indeed not given much airtime on television. Uh, the things that we have come to see as the icons of architecture, not really there on Channel 9 at 7 o'clock. What we see more of is this kind of architecture. Uh, we see more of these things. Uh, all right, not as, as iconic perhaps in the eyes of architecture students, but certainly iconic in my eyes. Uh, and there was one program um, from my youth that I started to think about that completely made me see that not only is there no disparity between television and architecture, but they have been friends forever. And it is this program. That's right, the Smurfs. The Smurfs, to my mind, are the foundation of all architecture. It's, it's really not that complicated. Papa Smurf right here. He is the icon for me and I think for all of us. Why, you'll ask. Sure. Well, just look at these houses. I mean, they are pretty much perfect as far as architecture goes and for the people living in them. They are perfectly made for the Smurfs. Let's think about it for a second. They're perfect proportions for who they are intended for. They're made out of an eco-material. They're absolutely perfect. Grow out of the earth, right? This is what we talk about every day, what you probably talk about every day. Let's get back to the basics, people. Mushrooms, right? <laughs> They're scalable. You can have them just about anywhere in any country. It doesn't really matter where, when. Uh, they're prefab. Again, on the bandwagon, before a bandwagon even existed. And they have unique detailing, so that even though they are um, they are uh, pretty much the same. You can add little touches to make them yours, which is, again, what we look for in just about any media or any architecture. And all for the little blue person, who is very happy to be living in a mushroom. I'd love to be living in a mushroom and sucking on that ice cream. And so let's look at a, a little bit at the details of what it's like to be mushroom living. As you can see, mushroom living is actually quite nice because you can actually say goodnight to each other from house to house without even, you know, intercoms or cell phones. But at the same time, when you close those windows, they're insulated enough for you to be able to do some work and not bother anyone. It's kind of nice all night long. Good insulation. And of course, there's plenty of other ways <laughs> to, look at, to look at this. As you can see, the cap protects the Smurf house from the environment, the rain, the sun. I mean, look at the gills, uh, vertically thin, thin radiating plates on the underside of the cap. Uh, it's really a wonderful construction. You can see that there's two floors. You can see that the fresh water supply and the drainage come from the same place. How economical. What, uh, you know, it's a wonderful way to live. Uh, the dong shingles, of course, are there to, to protect from the environment. Uh, the steam, the stem connection from the, from, from the, uh, the beam to bearing is absolutely genius, of course, created by nature. Um, and, of course, you need some uh, reinforcing tresses just in case Gargamel comes around and, and squashes your, your village. It's not that great. And the addition of a fireplace is, of course, genius, as we all know uh, from city living. It's, it's nice to have a little, uh, little wood-burning fireplace in your mushroom. Uh, of course, there's one thing that it's not that great for. It's not that great in typhoons. Uh, the mushrooms do tend to come up from the ground. Uh, but apart from that, it's pretty perfect. So what is really the real world design impact of Smurf architecture? Well, as the people in Wales know full well, uh, it's the, the grass huts are absolute uh, copies of what Papa Smurf has done. Uh, and they seem to be working out pretty well for them. The uh, houses that come from the ground in Norfolk uh, are also a good example of how Smurf architecture has been plagiarized. Uh, and it seems to be working quite well. Uh, even the classics, Gaudi, uh, for example, uh, took Smurf architecture and did sculptural things with it. You know, I mean, it's 
just amazing how you can go from Smurf architecture to something that is now considered a classic, plagiarism. That's all this is. Uh, in uh, India, you've got these, uh, these constructs, uh, these architects who are building entire mountains that are uh, predicated on Smurf philosophy and Smurf architecture. Coming from the ground, you even see the strata and, and, and making a slope full of trees and the mushrooms. It's all there. You know, I don't have to, to say much. The evidence is in. Uh, there, uh, a, a company, um, an architectural company out of the UK called Sybarite, uh, who is now erecting modern style uh, mushroom-like uh, mushroom -like houses on, on treetops, which also could be, uh, could be said to, to resemble Smurf architecture. Even one, uh, even, uh, you know, one of the big uh, architecture firms, Future Systems, uh, with the Selfridges store in Ireland, I believe, uh, again, aping the shapes of, of mushrooms and in, the, in, in its overall shape and, of course, in its building material. Mushroom caps. Who knew? Um, is, there, is there a way out of this? Well, actually, uh, uh, one of the people sitting in the audience today is trying to take the, uh, the, the, the Smurf village and the Smurf architecture and trying to give it angles, you know, making new things with it in the southwestern uh, part of America, trying to do, uh, trying to take the idea of of uh, of, uh, of uh, Smurf architecture and putting it in nature, but but doing something a little different with it. But so, what is the societal impact of Smurf architecture? Well, of course, urban sprawl is uh, one of the first that come to mind. The idea of all these mushrooms gathered around a tree. Well, we've seen that before, haven't we? Uh, in urban sprawl, going and creating suburbs. Uh, out of sameness, yet uh, unique details that, that make the, uh, the, the houses just so that it's okay to move there. Uh, and we're getting better at those, uh, making even more Smurf-like, even though they are uh, part of the urban sprawl. Uh, another thing that's also uh, a huge impact is the eco-building, the sustainable design that, uh, Mushra, that uh, Smurf uh, architecture has been able to impose upon us. And sustainable design, of course, started uh, about 25 years ago with this book by E.F. Schumacher titled Small is Beautiful, right? Smurfs again. It's unbelievable. Uh, of course, sustainable design does not start with, uh, with Smurfs. It started not by adding, but, that's, but about, by subtracting from the earth. And that's what happens in these villages. Um, I'm not sure where. Um, and of course, you have these uh, houses. How could you not see the um, the um, the smurfitude, if you will? Uh, uh, and now we're trying to create our own bubbles, our own mushrooms under which we can recreate a smurf world and all be happy. Uh, these houses, again, uh, introducing fireplace holes. It's all there. It was all there to begin with, and then finally coming together with television, we're building giant mushroom TVs you know, in stadiums, of all things. Of course, with every pro, there's a con, and there are unfortunate interpretations of Smurf architecture. I would say what's happening in Dubai right now, uh, you know, not that great, great opportunities, but there are things happening, such as creating a world uh, out of islands, which, again, uh, we could do without. The, this, is, this is not the idea that Papa Smurf put forward. The idea of creating your own mushroom cap to put your own luxury villa on I'm sorry, but that's not what was envisioned to begin with. Uh, what was envisioned was this. Simplicity, economy, wisdom for a little blue person. And what we try to do at the apartment is get inspired by the Smurfs. And so one of the things that we've done is, first of all, borrow the fantastically blue color. And uh, we reacted to this uh, idea of community uh, with a project we built uh, this year, last year in, in Brooklyn when a uh, developer came to us um, who had just bought basically an entire block and said, what can we do here? We thought, we thought, instead of developing one building per one building, which would have been easy enough to do, we thought, pop a smurf. And we thought, let's develop a community that is all about well, just that, community. Try to grab back, try to get back the idea of community from the internet where it seems to have evolved 
and take it back into the real world where we no longer ask our neighbors for sugar and create a community based on the Smurfs' ideals. And we've called that community hello after the first thing that you say when you get to know somebody. So what's hello? Hello is a place in Brooklyn, right here, that was built and finished and sold. Um, and the, the idea was to unite, instead of putting all the amenities that seem to be more and, popular these, more and more popular these days, and all under one roof, we decided that each building should have its own amenity. And we're talking about six different build, buildings, one with a pool, one with a screening room, one with a gym, one with a, uh, a, a kids' uh, creative play area, one's with a game room, one with a business and entertainment center. And the idea was that we would share all those, amenity, all those uh, amenities uh, between all the people that lived in all buildings, being able to get them together, being able to share hands, each finding their inner smurf. Very, very important in architecture today. And so that's what we did for all these buildings. And um, there's only two of, two of them here, but you can see also uh, 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 trying to modernize the idea of the Smurf ideal, even the brochure, trying to look at everything as a group, as a community-based initiative, as opposed to selling square footage. Even on the other side of the, uh, of the brochure, being able to write the person's name uh, so that we would get personal, so that we would get intimate with the person that we're selling real estate to. And of course, uh, being able to predict their future. And all this, thanks to who? Well, thanks to our little bearded guy, Papa Smurf. And that's all we have for you today. Thanks, Stefan, and thanks again for the eye candy exhibition on the other side of the wall. Um, after the roundtable discussion, we'll uh, adjourn for a coffee break. But right now, I'd like to invite all of our panelists uh, to the stage for a roundtable discussion moderated by Bob Thompson. Stefan did all that with the Smurfs. I'd hate to think if you ever saw Pee Wee's Playhouse. Thanks again for all of you uh, being here. Um, I want to start out, and hopefully this will just become a conversation and I, I will just uh, uh, shut up after that, but I want to start out with uh, two things that really came out in these things, and that is this notion of television in some cases as a place, a physical place. And I noticed it mostly in uh, 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 Lynn and Frank's um, presentation, but I think it comes into all the rest of them as well. I remember growing up that that mantra live from Television City in Hollywood was probably one of the things we heard more often than any other single uh, sentence. And I know for me as a kid, that really positioned, for one thing, I thought there was a television city, that, that there was this like place, uh, uh, and, and it was somehow better. Detroit was only motor town. This was television city. 
Now, I never really went through the sense. It didn't make much sense. How could Television City be in Hollywood, which is itself not a city, is it, or a community, or whatever, but whatever. That word Hollywood was also. So we had television, we had city, we had Hollywood. And that was at the same time, of course, Disneyland had just come up with Adventureland and uh, Tomorrowland uh, and all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to ask you about the way in which that was positioned in that mantra, which certainly we all remember. But then to get to um, Frank, uh, current TV, I can understand this kind of nonsense going on in the 50s. Current TV is supposed to be, though, the internet and the new technologies and whatever, uh, uh, all this kind of stuff. And by gosh, if you don't seem to be playing the same game with this, with this chemosphere. And uh, I've been watching current TV from the beginning. I think it does some really interesting stuff. But if you could talk a little bit about the, the ways in which I hear all these metaphors from like the old media. So this is all new internet, current TV, but it's a channel. And then the constant description of well, we'll have pods, new, but they'll be shuffled like by a DJ, quaintly old fashioned in the age of the uh, iPod. And then that chemistry building seems, and again, I like what current TV, but it almost seems like somebody my age, or maybe Al Gore's age, vision of the future. This is what our social studies final chapter textbooks used to look like. There'd be the chemisphere-like thing, and there'd be a flying car pulling into the, uh, uh, into the garage. So I find it fascinating how current TV and Television City both have this notion of claiming a place. The very fact that current TV has a studio in some ways is so charmingly 20th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can you hear? No, you can. Well, really the, the idea comes from creating, we thought it just in a very primal, instinctive way, we thought we need to anchor and have a place. And since Los Angeles is kind of one of the few places where the pebble kind of hits the pond culturally, you know, and it emanates out in, in New York City as well. And, but uh, for media, that's, that's an important place, I think. People look, they, they, they chase celebrity, they, you know, it's, things happen. Architecture moved there in the mid-century in many ways and uh, because of the climate and this, this celebration, uh, mushrooming, of, of, uh, of, of uh, a new way of, of looking at, at architecture and lifestyle uh, was, was something that was very exciting then and I think it remains there still, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, my my love of mid-century architecture and design started in the '80s. Uh, yeah, I started hanging around with like I, I didn't deserve it, but I, I having lunch with Ray Eames and and uh, and going to dinner with Frank Stanton and stuff like this because of doing some work with uh, with some um, really notable film directors. Uh, I it it. I was blessed with just the fascination with the sense of place. And so it seemed natural, I think, for us to, to respond quickly with an idea that said, what would be the coolest place to hang out in the kind of way that, how does the television jump out at the viewer and, and how can you, you wish as a viewer to be able to hang out with these peers? We're a peer-to-peer -peer network. We're asking for them to contribute how can we, in return, sort of reach back and say, hey, you know, come with us. Uh, wouldn't it be great if you could come visit us in our hangout? And, uh, and, and to have a living space, you know, where casual conversation would come, not formal rehearsed conversation. And that's one of the problems, I think, is the formal behavior mismatching the casual atmosphere, which we're trying to, we're trying to rework. And it's, you know, uh, we haven't, I, I wouldn't, say that we've even cracked the code yet with the big idea of the network that Al brought forward, uh, uh, but we're working on it. And in, in, there's, there, in some aspects it works, in some aspects it doesn't. And uh, if we, my phone's ringing, I'll, I'll answer. Oh, 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 is that yours? No, so, uh, oh yeah, it is. So, uh, so I guess in short, to answer your question, those, we wanted to just have a groovy place for our viewers to share in the visual experience, and, and that's the one we picked. It's interesting, though. It is groovy. It, it's almost the place that I would have dreamed of hanging out when I, in my yeah. childhood. And yeah. maybe that's been, maybe it's the whole 
kind of retro repackaging, but it's the one thing that always fascinates me about Current is it's compared to DJs and it's it's hanging out in my cool clubhouse. Right. Um, but then these 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 young people come on with the spiky hair and stuff, and they don't sound or look anything like. I think the the DJ metaphor holds up, and it's nothing. It's not a '90s thing. It's not a millennial thing. It's something that goes back even to vaudeville. Uh, you know, having a host or a pair of hosts, you know, was product of CBS radio and Bill Paley and all that. You know, all this evolved from, from uh, uh, television and the way we depict it evolved from that basic holding pages in front of a microphone. What else can we do? You but know, the YouTube the model has totally annihilated that, where you are now your own vaudevillian. Totally MC. agree. I totally yeah. agree. But I think the DJ model kind of holds up, it, especially for a network of short form. What I'd like to see is I'd like to see us be able to share in the quest and mission of seeking knowledge and making sense of this world by young people for young adults, not young people, young adults, for other young adults. And, and if I could get closer to the DJ model, I would, because my some of my favorite media grazing is, is around radio. And when somebody uh, brings to their set uh, a bunch of short form music or information that they glue together in a story arc, it makes something better than the sum of the parts. Uh, there's a narrative that, 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 that goes uh, in addition to the short form content that they're providing and they're making comparisons and they're gluing it all together in a very effective, and being in the now. And, and, and our network uh, strives to get closer and closer to the now with the production constraints that, and burden that television has. So that's the right direction for sure, and I don't think there's anything antiquated about the DJ model per se. And also, you see, it, it's 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 a byproduct of the of nightclubs, and 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 people can relate to that. And it's kind of a job, it's kind of a gig that a lot of people would have anyway. It's relatable. People, you know, serve up their own media through iTunes, and it, it's it's kind of they're already doing it at home. So we're just trying to be the the uh, uh, the the I guess. follow the same media grazing behaviors that our audience does and illustrate some connectivity in the future, which you'll see more of, which we're not doing in the chemistry. We're not really connected in the chemistry, and that's a good observation. But how about this? It's considered to be, um, you know, just game shows, soap operas got shot there, went off variety shows, but a total waste of space. And in fact, set designers were quoted saying, it's so sad to see all this space going to nowhere. So um, as, as time went on, the studio actually got used more for market research, which was Stanton's other major goal in life. He was both a modernist and a market researcher. And so um, the tourist trade from the farmer's market still go in there and test pilots. But I do think what you say about place um, and the imagination of place on television is really important. And that's where I ended thinking about how much this kind of transfer of um, modern architecture from New York to uh, LA was also so much a transfer of a kind of national imaginary for where we were when we watched TV. It wasn't, you know, in the early days it was all from New York or maybe Chicago. And suddenly it became, you were inscribed and addressed as an Angelino after that. Maybe your network's really doing the same. Yeah. The other, the other interesting thing about CBS in the early days, they did a great job of sort of vertically integrating their brand, you yeah. know, through through the print media, through on screen, through the CBSI, through the architecture, and that was, they were right, they they got it right. It was so important because what you had is you had people who would land on a network on a nightly basis and stick with it, you know, based on the news never made money for networks, but it got people to the network and then they stayed. They stayed through the uh, through the dramas and the evening the, and the comedies and the varieties that followed. So um, people didn't get up from their sofa and, and, and change channels quite as quickly as they do uh, today. And, and there were there were only a few um, oh, networks. So it's very important for CBS to have. You know, you, if you study this stuff, uh, uh, you'll see that even today that, that CBS, ABC, NBC, uh, Fox, they have different settings on their cameras. Uh, uh, CBS was always a little bit shifted, a little bit more blue, and NBC a little bit more orange. And these things are, and, and, if, and a good friend of mine works for ABC, he, he does World News Tonight, uh, and, and did night, uh, Nightline with Koppel for many years, and, and with Peter until Peter passed. And the idea of, for a network to even change their studio look is a big deal. It just doesn't happen, it takes years. 
in it, and the brass all have to fall into line and be in, in unanimous agreement. They just don't change rapidly and because they still believe in brand. It's interesting how TV land, even though that's not so much a place, it's an administrative way where of, of, of airing reruns on a cable channel, but still has that sense of, uh, you know, uh, this is a place, and you really know what TV land is like. It's got all that Populux, 50s, retro kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's exactly what current TV does really, really well, is give the news context. It gives, an, it gives a sense of place to these people who are talking about the news, which is something we love to do as people. We love to recognize things, just like when somebody on stage says, I'm from, uh, I'm from LA, and everybody goes, whoa! <laughs> we love to recognize stuff. And, and the same way with the chemosphere or with the retro atmosphere you were talking about, we recognize something, and that puts us in comfort, comfortable enough to be able to see actually heart-wrenching reports that are very quick, that, are, that you're supposed to, uh, to, to take in and think about, but that's best done in a comfortable state. So that's really interesting, because it, if I think from a marketing standpoint, absolutely, you've got to brand your identity. And from a soothing standpoint, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right, there's some pretty rough stuff on there, and those people kind of bring us back and comfort us, like an old anchor used to do uh, after Pearl Harbor. The, the question, though, that I keep coming back to is that seems to be so old school compared to what everybody seems to be thinking, how the news will be ultimately delivered. You know, the whole, everybody's saying, who cares that Katie Couric may leave CBS Evening News uh, after the elections? Nobody cares about these dinosaurs anymore um, because it's going to be delivered in this new nonlinear kind of that's always to me the, the, the hardest challenge of current TV is it works fine on the internet. What happens when you actually have to sit through the one you don't want to get to the one you don't? And I love that little thing that lets you the know you don't have to bar. wait very long. Yeah, yeah. the progress bar has is, is, is been – uh, and, and we have a, a new experiment to ride a sidecar to the, on top of the progress bar. Because whether you love it or hate it, you know how much longer yeah. you have to endure it. You know, uh, And for, non, for non-shows, non, non-set scheduled lengths, that actually gives a little navigational cue – for people that I think otherwise, you know, there's nothing great about random for random sake. You know, uh, having uh, 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 smashing heavy subjects against light ones is interesting, and we don't really take a lot of time to bend those corners like the nightly news might say, oh, gosh, that must be really hard for those people who lost their daughter. And there's a baby tiger being born at the zoo. You know, they have to make these, they, they take, they go to great lengths to turn those corners. We say, you know what, this, these media graders just don't care about that. Just just surf it up, yeah. and and go go smash them up against each other. But even better than random and short form is if that short form is programmed. And so uh, if if again uh, the DJ if the DJ shows up with good records, um, it's a much better offering than than uh, and if they know their material, uh, it's 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 curated. It's curated random short form. And what I love about that myself, and actually the reason why I love current TV more on TV than I do on the internet is because it makes a passive medium seem active. And it makes, it makes me feel like I'm getting culture in very short bursts. And that's what, really what I'm looking for today. Whether I'm reading, or I'm talking, or I'm looking at anything, what I'm looking for is a form of general culture, which I don't get from any one thing. But a medium like current TV, however passive it might be, since I can't really act on it from my couch, it makes me feel like an active <coughs> participant. And, and that's, I think, the genius of that of that mm-hmm. channel. Thanks. Yeah. 
Well, if you, have to, if you have to pick a place in LA, if you've been to LA in the last few years, there's not a lot to pick from. I mean, there's, uh, as far as uh, um, iconic symbols of Los Angeles, LA builds and tears down in much the same way that, that it builds and tears down sets. And it's always right. been that they just tore down the ambassador. Right. You know, but it's-, it's uh, Sure, but what I was trying to say that it was a great opportunity yeah. to engage contemporary right. architects from LA or from everywhere, because they can True. fly to- I, I, I think that's that totally valid. Education also to educate the public, because I think the public is completely uneducated in architecture. They are much more educated in anything else. You know, and anybody who goes to a, to a good uh, high school comes up with a, with a different understanding of modern art, for example. They will not laugh in front of a Mondrian, right? And they don't have the equivalent understanding of, of, of architecture. Totally and agree, and we could, and, and Even college, and you know, unless you go and take a class in, in architecture, you really don't understand. You don't know how right. to read it. I mean, anybody with a college degree can read a test, can understand the difference between sure. you know, a good author and a trust novel. And nobody graduating from college, unless they pass by architecture school, has any idea about yeah, architecture. Well, that's our, we, we, we pursue it through our through our, our original programming quite a lot through prefab ar prefab architecture right. design. You right. know, it's it's the it's the we can tell the story better than it, than in a single backplate. It's I think we can do a better job of it. Uh, by commissioning, right. by soliciting, and by executing but on short form right. content that is interesting. Just you would look at the design, look at the magazine rack. It's full of art and design. Right. You go to television, there's nothing. I mean, there's really nothing there. Right. So it's an opportunity for us. Right, right. No, I understand. That. Yeah, you also. Well, I was, I was going to pipe in. Maybe now I have to rethink this, given what Beatrice has just said about the sort of avoidance of using modern art, like sort of contemporary, contemporary, art, right. contemporary architecture. But I wanted to say something about the specificity of John Lautner's work in terms of the chemosphere as your studio. And I understand your, your question about the, the old form of televisual studio uh, presentation and that itself is a piece of retro nostalgia, which may or may not work. It may, it may, it may be comfort, but it may also be more static. But Lautner, I think, and, and I'm going to ask this as a kind of polemical question because I'd like to hear other people's responses. Lautner is one of those mid-century architects who, if we're going to have nostalgia for mid-century architecture, his architecture, because of the televisual appropriation of it through the Jetsons, especially in that house, was, was a, a kind of architecture that was at the moment it was built, a vision of the future. From, and now it's a vision of the future from the sure. past. Mm -hmm. but, and so you're, you're, you're citing that nostalgia. But because it got rooted through the Hanna-Barbera vision of the future to its hyperbole, to the hyperbole of what the future would be like that we're not quite living in, it does seem, I mean, in defense of the set, it does seem to, to evoke all of those uh, pieces of the imaginary, sure. not just mid-century architecture, but the television of the Jetsons. You, and you have to say that you live in a water house. I'm sorry. I know. I, I, I actually wondered why John, since he said you lived in a lot in your apartment, he didn't include yeah, it. He was in a house. I mean, yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, this little yeah. indulgent. <laughs> active. And the, the, the desire to be duped, you know, the, the, 
is a, I'm sure, is an absolutely widespread and shared it's the glory of desire. God. But, but to what art, it's best in. But to say it in a university, wow. I mean, it's just, Probably. whoa. No, 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 I thought, I, under, I, 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 I did not get it as a polemic. But, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's still worth talking about the different techniques that architecture and media or the shared techniques that they have to produce false images of action and uh, to transform notions of passivity into uh, comfort and place and so forth. Well, I, I would say, if I could, that, that it all co comes back to Plato's cave. The, 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 uh, the shadows we see on the wall, the, the truths. Yeah, they, they pop up later, absolutely. The truths that we see and then are liberated from and go see the real truths outside. Uh, I don't think those two truths are necessarily exclusive. I think we can enjoy the real truth and at the same time enjoy the fiction or else there would be no Balzac. There, will be, there would be nobody to entertain with the impossible. And that's what is fundamentally nice about being, as you said, uh, duped willfully. I was just going to say, I think um, certainly since Bill Bow, right, since that museum and with this whole phenomenon of architecture tourism, architurism um, with of contemporary buildings, and I think we're going to see it dramatically in Beijing this summer. I have a feeling that several buildings are going to be focused on television worldwide constantly. So I, I think that, you know, I think that I would have agreed more, you know, 10 years ago that architecture is absent vanished from the television set, vanished from the public mindset. But I, I sense the last five to 10 years, a reemergence of, you know, look at the Dubai, you know, the Burj Dubai, you know, Al Arab, you know, everyone, see, everyone knows it. And that those images of the, uh, of the new cities arising in the harbor, uh, images of various museums around the world, these are very familiar current images now. They kind you know, they're, they're not- promotional. They're promotional, they're branded images. You know, in a way, the, I mean, it's, it, I don't think it's a question about place versus non-place. It's really a question about how place is branded, right? And how place is turned into an image that's flexible, mobile, that can be identified with uh, companies, that can be identified with itineraries of individuals, consumable itineraries. And that's happening, I think, dramatically through these new crop of buildings. It might not, be, it might not have much to do with their architectural qualities, but certainly it has to do with their spectacle qualities and their ability to stand in for an experience that the public can then identify with. So you're saying like when, when a donut shop used to be shaped like a donut or a egg place was shaped a like the old duck, all that stuff, that, that kind of, that no question. building is signed? Well, there's no question. I remember when my father, you know, I was working on my dissertation in Vienna on auto flows and my father came to, you know, came to visit and he, you know, I took him to one Loos building and he was like, okay. And he wouldn't even go in. And then he found the Hundertwasser house by, you know, this spectacle, oh, kind of a mushroom. Do you, know, you know it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you got you know what I'm saying? The pilgr and he went crazy <laughs> with that house. And, you know, so it had to be something that was uh. exuberant <laughs> form and shape and spectacle and, and for, him, for him and perhaps most much of the public to react. <clears throat> I, no, I was just going to respond earlier to your point and uh, Beatrice's point about... Uh, you know, of architecture and um, why, why we're so old-fashioned in a way. And, and I think one, one of the interesting places to go is Second Life, to see what's happening on there. Uh, because, you know, there's, no, there's really no innovation happening there, but there might be replication. And I was thinking that maybe one of the, thing, one of the tools that we could be using more effectively is a platform like Second Life, you know, to put your parade of current uh, architecture. If, if no one's going to innovate, at least we can expose right. on that platform. Yeah, I, I actually was uh, was planning to do something with my students next year about architecture in, in second grade. Oh, me too. Yeah, that's that's my can, studio can topic. Look, you, you can I just we say, should talk. We, we, we should also yeah. talk about yeah. this. Well, anyway. If, if my paper had been allowed to be a bit longer, the second part of it was about architecture in second grade. Ah. Mm. And it's part of another project that I'm working on. And it's true that Second Life has taken this direction where it either goes mimetic and completely rebuilds the Farnsworth House, mm -hmm. or it, it, it has the freedom of gravity and everything else to be innovative. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a lot to do with it. 
Uh, sure. Are those the two options that no, you, know, you do nostalgic 50s architecture, or are you moving to outer space and you don't have any architecture exactly. at all? Exactly. No, exactly. those aren't the, I, I think what, it's not 50s, it's not just 50s, it's that much of the architecture in Second Life, well, that's one example, but every university that has a campus in Second Life, they try Princeton, tries to rebuild the, the buildings of Princeton in Second Life, or Stanford in Second Life, and that's mimetic, it's mimetic uh, virtual. Uh, the, so it's it's not just mimetic to mid-century. It's mimetic to any kind of art, brick by brick and pixel by pixel. It's being rebuilt, unlike the more innovative projects, which are you know wildly. Yeah, that's uh, for Smurfs. And because you fly, you know you do. You fly and you can move through spaces that are uh, you know kind of gyroscopic and 3D and very deep. It's it's. I hate to do this, uh, we're gonna have to open up to the uh, audience because I think we've got another session starting uh, before long, long and we're behind. So uh, now if anybody has a question, it would be the time to uh, stand up. And are there mics people have to go to or how does that work? All right. You're good. By the way, you look fabulous in that red TV. Uh. <laughs> you look really good in black and white television. Have you got a question? Oh, use mine. Yeah. Anne, a uh, question for Anne Friedberg. <laughs> Not to interrupt. Is this a game show? It is. <laughs> your description, I, I really appreciate your description of, uh, you know, what you call a kind of largesse of remote visuality and the notion that it could operate accretively to somehow thicken the presence of something we typically understand to be virtual or lacking dimension in a sense. You talked about a kind of thickening through the sections that you showed, the sections of the cathode ray tube and things like that. You talked about a thickening in terms of a shift from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. And it strikes me that when you're talking about a light emitting device as opposed to the projecting device, there might also be a kind of shift from a kind of Cartesian set of logics that have to do more with Alberti's window and less with television. Um, and so maybe to talk about it in terms of Cartesian space or a kind of window framing is not maybe as productive or radical as it might be. How would you respond to that? Well, because I mean, just to, to kind of contextualize the question, there's something about the appearance of the TV consoles that you showed in the photographs that is so obviously alien to the perspectively constructed spaces um, that, that are housing them, that it really, it seems like a kind of Cartesian alternative to me in a sense. Um, well, I'm not certain I followed all of your question because I was, be the beginning of it was about the thicknesses and clearly I, I was playing with the, the, the flatnesses of uh, the screen material, but maybe, my answer has to go back to second life, which is that I only wrote this paper for this conference because I was asked to and hadn't really been thinking about televisuality for a while, but had been thinking a great deal about second life and the, the, the relation between two dimensions and three dimensions. 
And, the, and I have been thinking and working on the 3D web, which really transforms uh, even the uh, kind of all of the arguments about perspectival space. I mean, one moves through the 3D web in a very different way, albeit with an avatar, albeit with a very awkward and clunky body bodily interface. But so my 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 sort of back engineered approach to the cathode ray tube was to think about the relation of that that kind of thick, uh, awkward, and, and Lynn has written about its place in the home. It's, it was this thing, it was a piece of furniture that came in as a console in deranged domestic space. Well, the, the, the flatness of the screen, which is more like the flatness of a window, and, and Sylvia just leaned over and asked me where, where my television was placed in my home because it, uh, I, have, I have glass walls. And sure. it's round. Uh, 280 degrees. And so it's placed against uh, a plate glass window. And I don't have the kind of game that I showed in those transparent computer screens ever set up on my TV screen yet, but I could. Um, anyway, so I, I, I think Maybe you could like rephrase your question because the, the the thing about Second Life as a new depth to the very flat screen is that it does force us to rethink the representational, and I think as architects have to work in it too. It's it's more like working in three dimensional modeling than than you know drawings can be, uh, but it does force us to rethink the relation between the very flatness of the screen because we're looking, our interface with 3D, the 3D web is through a flat screen. Even though the, you know, the virtual imagined space might be very different. Did that sort of address what you're asking? Anybody else? I'll bring the mic to any other questions. Yep. Hello? Okay. Um, I guess I was just wondering about this move where TV is being recognized as some, a medium that needs to become, I guess, more interactive. And I'm wondering if there's going to be a kind of new, new form of passivity. If, if passivity is a kind of antiquated idea, or is it just going to be replaced with something else if TV is becoming, uh, be, becoming a different form as it is now? I'm going to talk about that. Maybe that's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> After the commercial break. After yeah. the break. Thank you. One more question and then The, the dual screen experience created uh, by current TV of the television and the web. Um, and I kind of feel that the TV right now is just a representation of this performative screen of the web. And I didn't know, uh, my question for anybody yet is how does the TV screen become more performative or is that, is that necessary? It, the question is, is, does TV exist anymore? I think that's the question. <laughs> I mean, and that's maybe we can come to a conclusion at the end of today. I don't I really think it does. I mean, I guess I would say since my book, my recent book was called T Television After TV, yeah. so I guess I think it doesn't. But that classic form of TV, the kind that TV City produced, we don't see much of that. It's residual now. I mean, there's some of it, but it's residual. And clearly the emergent thing is emerging, but it does have to do with what, what is TV. And is it just showing the web, or is it, you know, um, interaction that's really just marketing, you know, telemarketing, or what exactly is it? And I think we're we're not sure yet. Before we get to, oh, sorry. Can I just just add to that question because it, it's a question of does TV still exist? And maybe we can all agree that it doesn't, but the televisual still does. Perfect. And and so the redefinition of well, this is why television after t TV still has televisuality. In and all of the forms that we can incorporate under the mushroom umbrella of televisuality can include all of those other forms that, yeah, um, <laughs> started it, um, that involve the 
the web and the iPhone and the other um, apparatuses of delivery. I think before we get too breathless about how television is over, though, um, I mean, all of these futurists are, are acting like this is a done deal. Um, we just had two YouTube CNN debates. That would argue that maybe television is over. YouTube is in less than three years incorporated with CNN, uh, and it gets its name mentioned first. However, of 300 million people in this country, exactly 8,000 submitted YouTube things, an opportunity to get it on national TV, an opportunity to be uh, seen by the potential next president. 8,000 out of uh, 300 million is statistically none, meaningless. That same year, 124,000 got into a plane, train, or automobile, good old fashioned, in, uh, you know, on, on real highways, not information highways, and they drove to a city to, to audition for American Idol based on a show that started in the 1930s and had call ins right. and postcards and all the rest of it. So right. before we, we uh, dismiss this old broad of network television in the old television city uh, uh, model. I think uh, she's got a few more tricks up her sleeve. Yeah, and uh, 110,000 is a lot more than eight. I, I, think, I, totally agree. I think my point here is that TV as we knew it. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't speak. Uh, TV as we knew it is. Oh, it's you, it's, not the mic. You know what it is? It's that I have another mic on that was never turned on. Can you hear me? Okay, so my point was TV as we knew it as a form of spectatorship, as a particular social occasion, doesn't exist in the way that it did. We don't go to, we don't think of TV as a weekly thing we watch, and you know, we all know what that means, but those kind of programs are over. So I do think at this point we're in that kind of classic position of what's residual, what's emergent, what's dominant, and there's no kind of linear movement, but we're seeing something else evolve, even if there is American Idol, you know. With that, uh, let's take a quick break, and I think we're back here at 4 o'clock in the same uh, room. Thank you all.